निर्वन ओम चौधरी डायरेक्टर प्रोफेसर एनेस्थेसियोलॉजी टीवी पंत एंड ऑल द स्पीकर्स डॉक्टर अमित कुमार साहू डॉक्टर अविनाश कुमार एंड डॉक्टर नीति अरुण एंड ऑल द एक्सिक्यूटिव कमिटी मेंबर सो दिस इज आवर फर्स्ट सीएमई ऑफ बीजेएसए so our theme is the anesthesia in obstetric cases pregnancy so all the best to our learned speakers and the program is handed over dr ajay for the further process the name is thank you thank you thank you sir okay thank you uh, thank you for your valuable words and uh, now i would like to call dr bk prasad sir our scientific chairman please say few words sir about this cme bk prasad sir thank you very much for giving me opportunity to discuss something after a long gap we have started this cme and i hope this will be continued in future also as the dr ajay has tried or the dr jp has tried to accommodate from all the wings as one of the doctor from private practitioner and second one from bokaro consultant and the third is dr nidhi arun from igms so i hope this will be the best start and the performance will be very lively and we will discuss all the topics because all the topics are very prominent very imminent and uh, very practical approach with one research paper by dr nidhi aru i congratulate you all even including the participants to have this discussion here with us thank you very much thank you thank you sir thank you bk prasad sir uh say sir uh, this is uh, we our start sir uh, the private practitioner we always uh, think about the private practitioner for this forum and this month i also motivating the all private practitioner to participate in Uh, our uh, bihar jharkhand conference so i always motivating all of them sir and uh, now bajwa sir join now and uh, uh, now i i would like to welcome and i would like to call dr manoj kumar sir our guest of honor please say a few words regarding this बाजवा सर नाउ ज्वाइन अजय बॉस बाजवा सर नाउ ज्वाइन बाजवा से सर ओके फर्स्ट डॉक्टर मनोज प्लीज डॉक्टर मनोज प्लीज अनम्यूट योर सेल्फ बॉस ओके फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई एम वेरी हैप्पी टू स्टार्ट अगेन रीस्टार्ट ऑफ द बीजीएसए वेबिनार i am very thankful to our state secretary dr ajay kumar dr jp jay prakash uh, motilal das sir president and uh, scientific uh, chairman dr bk prasad sir so warm welcome our chief guest dr sukvinder jit singh bajwa honorary secretary of ic national and uh, welcome uh, warm welcome moderator dr anju gerwal madam professor and head department of anesthesiology एम्स भटिंडा एंड डॉक्टर अनिर्वन होम चौधरी डायरेक्टर प्रोफेसर जी बी पंत हॉस्पिटल न्यू दिल्ली एंड माई बेस्ट विशे टू द स्पीकर डॉक्टर अमित कुमार साहू बी जी एच हॉस्पिटल बोकारो डॉक्टर अविनाश कुमार प्राइवेट प्रैक्टिशनर एंड एम ओ एट बोकारो एंड निधि अरुण एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ एनेसिया आई जी एम एस पटना आई एम वेरी थैंकफुल to bihar jharkhand executive body as well as all the post graduate student and the delegates and our respected senior member and members of the bjsa and i am very thankful to ic national for 
his uh, for their blessings thank you very much thank you thank you thank you dr manoj and uh, uh, i i would like to call our chief guest dr sukhvinder singh bajwa sir please inaugurate this uh, cme webinar and say few words sir bajwa sir please thank you dr ajay it's really a uh, very great honor to be part of this webinars the the fresh start to already i think it was running for the last two years uh, from the time of covid and with the a new treasurer coming into the play and start of the dr ajay also and with the, all the organizing committee members especially the youngster that amara j so these things are going to be a hit i know that because you won't be leaving any stone unturned in making these academic events a uh, great success to begin with this webinar uh, first of all i would also like to greet all the office bearers isc office bearers of bihar and jharkhand state as well as city and uh, most probably we i will be meeting many of them uh, in the coming week also and it's a good beginning very august as beginning we have invited our moderator dr anju grewal and dr nirban nam choudhury they don't they don't need any introduction first of all to be very honest and in such a webinars of uh, repute of academic repute these are the i think the best moderators you have you know uh, requested to be part of this series and also the speakers i haven't interacted myself directly till date uh, i will be meeting them also very soon dr amit dr vinash and dr niri but the topics chosen are very good and to make it more precise that we at isa national are trying to make this year from national point of view dedicated to private practitioners and i am interacting with the different state secretaries and president that wherever feasible and possible whichever the good private practitioner they want to come to the academic front or whatever the academic work they can do by sparing some precious time out of their busy schedules they are most welcome and we have already started work on that practitioners module so they can be part of that practitioner module and they can uh, because that module uh, is very much required for our indian practitioners because majority of them don't get a chance to pre present themselves at the national and state conferences it's just like a quota is reserved that this is the practitioner forum you speak only there why not in the cme why not in the other major conference lectures so i think the time has come that they should also come forward rather than having inertia or having shyness to just sit back and not to attend these webinars or conferences they should come up and there are a lot of opportunities and a lot of uh, programs are to be going to be launched for them and awards are also going to be launched very soon which we will be uh, discussing uh, in the our gc meetings presently i am really ha happy and very very you know delighted that since it's the society of my treasurer and partner so they are starting the new web series of this academic events and hats off to them that they are continuously doing it and previously i think they did it very 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 meticulously it was a hit and it will be again a hit i know that and uh, all my best wishes to every one every single worker of bihar jharkhand society office bearers of isa as well as the workers of isa and my best wishes to the today's speakers and i know they will be very well moderated by dr anju garewal and dr nirban hom choudhury with this i extend my wishes again long live isa kindly proceed with the inauguration of the uh, webinar please dr ajay you can take it from here thank you sir thank you for your kind words sir now uh, we will start the webinar uh, dr dr jay prakash now you start and you introduce the moderator and also introduce the, our speaker and uh, start the cme thank you thank you dr ajay boss 
So it's my pleasure to introduce such a personality eminent is moderator like Dr. Anju Grewal, ma'am, and Dr. Anirvan Hon Chaudhary sir. So Dr. Anju Grewal, ma'am, is professor and he head in AIMS Watinda. She is National Secretary Association of Obstetric Anesthesiology, Vice President of uh, Research Society of Anesthesiology, Clinical Pharmacology, and she uh, she was past editor in chief of JOSCP. Besides that. Dr. Anivan Hum Chaudhary is uh, director professor in anesthesia and critical care in JV Pant Hospital, New Delhi. So, <clears throat> I would like to uh, hand over to our first speaker, Dr. Amit Kumar Sahu. Uh, he is going to present the anesthesia for non obstetric surgery during pregnancy. He is consultant in Bokaro General Hospital. So, please share your screen, Dr. Amit Kumar Sahu. Dr. Jay, I will request as per the protocols of ISA, let the moderators take from here. Yeah, yeah. So, this should so, be as per protocols. Huh? Let the moderators uh, uh, take from here, whatever the speaker, let them take over. Okay, okay. so, so moderator can move. call. Yeah, so please, uh, sir, unmute Anirvan, sir, and Anju, ma'am, please unmute yourself. And you. Yes, thank you, Jay Prakash. Thank you, Anju Ma'am is there, and all, all my good friends are there, Dr. Bajwa. And it's nice to meet him after a long time. I, am, I can see all, many people whom I know by face, but I didn't know by name. So it is a nice and a way to get introduced. So I think the main purpose, we can, we can start the academics now. And probably the first speaker is Dr. Amit Kumar Sahu, if I am not wrong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Dr. Amit Kumar Sahu will be presenting yes, his topic on anesthesia for non-obstetric surgery uh, during pregnancy. So uh, uh, old wine in a new bottle, it's a old topic which have been, but definitely we will look for newer insights, newer things, and, uh, and, and definitely the new way how Dr. Sahu would like to please forward this topic. We are eagerly waiting to hear from here. Dr. Sahu, please. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, uh, many thanks to our respected uh, chairpersons, uh, chief guest, uh, and all BJSC secretary and organizing committee for giving me opportunity uh, for today's session. Myself, Dr. Amit Mousavu, uh, consultant from Bukaru General Hospital. I will be talking on the topic uh, that is uh, anesthesia for non obstetric surgery in pregnancy. So, uh, sir, uh, my screen is shared or Yes. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Go Please on. Slide it screen. Yes, yes. So, uh, coming to the topic. So, as we all know, that uh, pregnancy is uh, itself a uh, risk for both the mother and the uh, fetus. So, anesthesia consideration for non obstetric surgery during pregnancy. Earlier, uh, have many literatures. Uh, one of them, E. Rittman, had found that 0.75 to 2 percent of all pregnancies needed somewhere in first trimester or second or third trimester to go for uh, elective or emergency surgeries. So, indications of for surgeries are majorly looking into the adnexal masses. Second is the appendicitis, which is uh, one in uh, uh, 5,000 of the pregnant patients, biliary or mainly of the polycystitis is found to be in a ratio of 2.5 in 10,000 of pregnant patients and other indications which include the trauma, breast, bowel obstruction or cancer surgeries. So if we classify indications of surgery, uh, we can classify it in the three forms. It may be directly related to the pregnancy or indirectly related to the pregnancy or unrelated. So directly related can have or non-viable fetus in vitro fertilization, laparoscopy for assisted reproductive techniques, cervical in surprise surgery and fetal surgeries. Indirectly related surgery include the ovarian cystectomy, ovarian torsion or any other adnexal masses or uh, uh, torsion or rupture. Unrelated surgery include the surgical emergency in which appendicitomy is found to be um, having a more incidence as compared to the other surgical factors like the bladder mass or bowel obstruction. 
sometimes malignancy come up with a high risk to for, go for a surgery uh, beyond, uh, before continuing the pregnancy also so uh, other factors include trauma neurological procedure neurosurgery and some cardiac surgeries so if we uh, look into the literature given by the mazi ra in 1989 they found the first trimester surgery have a more percentage as compared to the second trimester or third trimester so they found first trimester to have a 42% of the surgeries and uh, second trimester 35% of the surgery and third trimester 23% of the surgery if we look into the uh, incidences we found that uh, first trimester have more number of uh, more, more percentage of surgery because of uh, the fact that many pregnant patient many women they didn't uh, they in the uh, may or may not bearing the child birth and uh, they have a need uh, approach so uh, for that we have to go for a urinary pregnancy test where we found that every patient is a child of child bearing years to rule out that factor so my goal now is to first optimize and maintain normal maternal physiological function optimize and maintain normal uterine placental blood flow and oxygen delivery avoid unwanted birth defect on fetus avoid stimulating the myocardium avoid awareness during general anesthesia and do it as soon as anesthesia is possible so before coming into the main part we also know thoroughly about the maternal physiology which can affect our nss plan so if we go into the system wise physiological changes during pregnancy we can observe in a cardiovascular system there is increased cardiac output of up to 50% increase uterine perfusion to 10% of the cardiac output in uh, decrease systemic vascular resistance decrease peripheral vascular resistance and decrease uh, aortic pressure so these anesthetic implications can have a uh, uterine perfusion not auto regulated during the uh, anesthesia procedure or hypotension common under the regional and general anesthesia are very common because of the decrease svr and decrease pvr auto caval compression from 13 weeks can be observed which can cause supine hypotension syndrome which may need left literated during the procedure in respiratory system we found that there is increased minute ventilation by 30% respiratory alkalosis which can range from 3.7 to 4.2 kpa decrease expiratory reserve volume decrease respiratory volume decrease uh, functional respiratory capacity and increase vq mismatch and increase oxygen consumption of up to 30% all these lead to the faster inhalation induction and maintains the pcio2 at an and our target is to maintain the psu2 at normal pregnancy level there is also increased thoracic diameter and upward displacement of the diaphragm which makes the breathing more diaphragmatic than thoracic potential hypoxemia in the supine and trigeminal positions are recommended there is also mucosal edema with uh, advancing pregnancy so it can lead to the increased vascularity of that area and uh, which further can cause difficult laryngoscopy and intubation and bleeding during the repeated attempts also coming to the cns there is an increased epidural vein engorgement which can cause bloody tap sometimes decreased epidural space volume and increased sensitivity to the opioids and sedatives which all can lead to a more extensive local anesthetic spread in git there is increased intragastric pressure which can increase the aspiration risk decreased barrier pressure which can lead to the which have an anesthetic implication that anti acid prophylaxis have to be given and rsi advised after 18 weeks of gestation at any moment in renal uh, system there is an increase in plasma flow and increase uh, gfr and decrease reobjective capacity this have an implication of normal urea and creatinine may mask impaired renal function glycosuria and proteinuria in hematological we can observe that there is increased red cell volume of 30% and increased wbc count also there is a increase of plasma volume of 50% which can lead to the dilution and anemia and sometimes this can lead to the uh even though the platelet factors are increased platelet count have to be increased but uh, because of the dilution we found the platelet count to be on a lesser side there is also increased uh, coagulation factor or uh, and pro coagulopathy which uh, uh, which involves all the factors 7 8 10 12 and prothrombin which can lead to the thromboembolic complications in the pregnancy there is also decreased albumin and colloid osmotic pressure which have a anesthetic complications of edema and decreased protein binding of the drugs and because of that uh, there have a more free fraction of the drugs in the circulation and increased duration of uh, the drugs 
so if we plan so uh, that this uh, picture shows the decision making algorithm for the non obstetric surgery during pregnancy so whenever a patient came for came for a surgery we have to find out if that patient is of posted for a elective surgery or essential or emergency surgery if it's a elective surgery during the pregnancy we try to delay until the postpartum period that is after 6 weeks of the delivery in essential surgery in the first trimester and second trimester we uh, judge if no or minimal increase risk to the mother and consider delaying until the mid gestation that is try to do the surgery during the second trimester of the uh, pregnancy if greater uh, if the uh, risk is greater than the minimal then we have to proceed with the surgery that is the emergency surgery can't be delayed at any point of time so we have to proceed with the optimal anesthetic for mother modified by the considerations for maternal physiological changes and fetal wellbeing also we have to consult a perinatologist or an obstetrician intraoperative and post op fetal and uterine monitoring may be useful during this stage so uh, if we approach to the patient so pre operatively we have to prepare a multidisciplinary team which include our anesthetist obstetrician neonatologist and have to consult all the concerns of the pregnancy as well as the fetus what are the indications of the surgery what is the site and uh, nature of the surgery what is the general condition of the patient and uh, is it possible to monitor fetal heart rate or uterine tone before and after the pregnancy so that fetal well being have to be assured as we uh, as already discussed in the previous slide that most of the patient female patients who are of child bearing age and are uh, misdiagnosed uh, uh, and later came out to be of pregnant during that uh, surgical period have to be uh, that's why this uh, acog guideline says that we have to go for the urinary pregnancy test of all the women who are posted for the surgical procedure uh, and where we suspect that patient may or may not be pregnant we have to given the option to the uh, female patient for going for a upt and uh, have to consult use of the tocolytic drugs it can be used or not second is the evolution counseling and reassurance so we have to evaluate and uh, counsel the patients about the surgical procedure and uh, patient have to be reassured about the safety of the anesthesia and no risk of teratogenicity patient and patient party should be warned of the increased risk of first trimester miscarriage and premature delivery in the second and third trimester third is the educate we have to educate the patient and patient party about the symptoms of the premature labor and reinforce need of left uterine displacement during the advanced pregnancy and documentation of all the risk details of the risk we have to discuss and have to be documented in the patient report for further uh, medical legal purposes and all those patients they have to be have go for a overnight fasting transport in the left lateral position careful assessment of the airway aspiration prophylaxis including the h2 blockers or proton pump inhibitor metoclopramide and in uh, pre operative hemoglobin level have blood grouping cross matching all have to be uh, documented and uh, if there is a lesser hemo lesser hemoglobin we have to ad uh, adequately arrange for the blood also so the preparation include all the drugs machine difficult air record suction and monitors prior to the taking of the surgery if you go by uh, trimester the main concerns in the first trimester if you look on maternal concerns include the increased oxygen requirement modified drug pharmacokinetics and careful airway examination in fetus there is a risk of teratogenicity impaired utero placental blood flow so if we go for a, a various literature we found anesthetic drugs are found to be in a category b or c that is there is a no risk involved or risk uh, minimal risk had been involved in the pregnancy period so till now um, what we are using in the modern anesthesia time most of the drugs does not cause any kind of teratogenicity in the pregnancy in a first trimester period except the benzodiazepine which had found to be uh, in a category d and that too also had been found to be controversial where we found that uh, single dose of midazolam what we use in a during the general anesthesia it does not cause any congenital anomaly it had been uh, found in the research that uh, over more than 18 hour or 24 hour of infusion of benzodiazepine uh, was associated with the uh, fetal anomaly found that uh, like cleft lip or cleft palate nitrous oxide again found to be controversial and uh, it had been associated with the uh, 
inhibition of methionine synthesis and uh, it also uh, found to have a if given in a longer duration can cause penitential uh, anomaly and nsaid found to be uh, if given during more than the 32 weeks of the pregnancy can cause the premature closure of the patent ductus arteriosus if we go in the second and third trimester uh, the concerns include maternal con concern include the as the uterus growing larger there it can cause aortic caval compression prone to hypoxia aspiration prophylaxis is needed preparation of difficult airway have to be in the cart avoid pre hyperventilation uh, hyperventilation and increase risk of thromboembolic events so if we found that uh, thromboembolic prophylaxis is have to be started to so then have to be started till the postpartum period in fetal concerns uh, in second and third third trimester include the premature labor intrauterine growth retardation intrauterine asphyxia fetal heart rate have to be monitored more than 18 weeks opioids induction agent inhalation agents decrease the fetal heart rate variability and vasoactive drugs can cause fetal tachycardia surgical concerns include disease related problem diagnostic difficulty diagnostic difficulties uh, linked to the all the uh, surgical uh, emergencies like the appendicitis or polycystitis if you take the appendicitis there is a similar feature in the pregnancy also if you found pain nausea vomiting abdominal tenderness which can also be seen in the first trimester of the pregnancy that is the pain nausea vomiting and also it's uh, become more difficult because of the uh, growing uterus the murphy point are going to be shift to the midline or above the uh, above the actual point of the tenderness then also it can cause the difficulty in the diagnosis of that so most of the diagnosis was found to be actually in during the uh, intraoperative period or if we go for the further investigations so it, uh, most of the surgical cases which we do in the pregnancy cases are were uh, difficult in the initial if we compare the clinical period next point is the prolonged exposure to the anesthetics surgical manipulations can increase the fetal risk anatomic and surface landmarks may become unreliable as i explained earlier so if we go in the third trimester at this stage gestation delivery by the cesarean section before major surgery is often recommended so if we are going for a major surgery in the third trimester then we have to think about the benefit and risk ratio and go for the cesarean section and delivery of the fetus first before going to the major surgery or if it, if it's possible uh, if it's in the 32 weeks or 34 weeks then we can go for a uh, delaying the surgery for 48 hours to allow the steroid therapy to enhance the fetal lung maturation surgery stress and perhaps anesthesia may suppress that lactation also at least temporarily the possible neonatal effects of the opioids and sedatives should be explained to the mother prior hand so if we compare the type of the anesthesia or plan of the anesthesia there are we uh, two which we majorly use in the our operation theater the general anesthesia or regional anesthesia during both uh, we have to try to monitor all the uh, asa2 standard monitors which can be possible that is non invasive blood pressure pulse oximetry and tidal carbon dioxide temperature ecg blood glucose use of pns in the ga fetal heart rate monitoring more than 18 weeks of gestation and topo dynamometer uh, can externally use for the uterine tone also so if we uh, see gen in, during a uh, general anesthesia if you are planning we have to go for a adequate oxygenation for in the functional respiratory capacity of a pregnant patient and go for a rapid sequence induction sometimes we have to use a lesser uh, smaller size of endo tracheal tube to intubate this such kind of uh, pregnant patient uh, we have to you go for aspiration prophylaxis difficult intubation algorithm maintain fio2 of 50% volatile agents can cause decrease uterine tone and uterine vascular resistance uh, is hence uh, it found to be uh, not so beneficial so if you want to use the volatile agent have to use less than the 0.5 mag opioids have no adverse fetal effects if delivery is not imminent avoid nitrous oxide prolonged exposure can cause anomalies avoid maternal hyperventilation respiratory or metabolic alkalosis pre op anxiety late anesthesia all those factors like maternal hyperventilation respiratory or metabolic alkalosis hyperoxia all these can cause uh, decrease due to placental blood flow and the fetal asphyxia so if we uh, but in this uh, one point is that the fit, uh, one point uh, is given in the hyperoxia 
So if we uh, found that uh, I found it in the literature that fetal PO2 never exceeds the 60 mm of Hg, even if even if maternal PO2 increases up to 600 mm of Hg because of the large maternal fetal oxygen tension gradient. Hence, hyperoxia is found to have no effect on the fetus. That means no PDA closure or retrolentor fibroplasia had been observed till now because of hyperoxia, because hyperoxia does not uh, increase the fetal PO2. Other factors include the avoid fetal asphyxia, like avoid uh, prolonged maternal hypoxemia, excessive poetic pressure ventilation, hypocapnia, hypercapnia, hypotension, uterine hypotonus. All these factors try to uh, reach our goal that you have to maintain the normal hemodynamic uh, of the patient pre -op as what she had preoperatively. We have to try to maintain that in the intraoperatively and postoperatively also. If we take both for the regional anesthesia, which is found to be better uh, beneficial as compared to the original anesthesia because of minimal fetal drug exposure and have a decreased blood loss during the surgery, reduced. Dr. Amit, I would request you, I would request you to stick to the time and try to wind up in yes, the next few minutes. Yes, sir. So uh, we have to uh, use sedation only when necessary, maintain the airway reflexes, avoid benzodiazepine, post op analgesia. Regional anesthesia, uh, spinal anesthesia have a risk of PDPH. So maintenance of uteroplacental perfusion include the factors maintain normal maternal PO2, avoid maternal hypercapnia, avoid maternal hypertension, hyperventilation, and uh, aggressively have to treat the hypotension because of the aortic function. If you go for the role of tocolytic drugs during the non obstetric surgery in pregnancy, we found it have to be way risk versus benefit that is two indications uh, usually used. First is the abdominal surgery involving the uterine manipulations. And second is the surgery with a high risk of premature level, like in the cervical or in cervical, which is mainly predominantly used in the second trimester of the pregnancy. All topologic agents had been uh, shown below and their maternal side effects and fetal side effects. Among all these factors, all, all these drugs, only that uh, endomethacin, which is a PG inhibitor, is not now longer recommended in the, uh, during the pregnancy period. If you go for the fetal outcome, there is no evidence of increased incidence of perinatal anomaly with any kind of anesthesia drugs. There had been found uh, reported of incidences of uh, spontaneous abortion, IUGR, and premature delivery and perinatal mortality. Changes in the uteroplacental circulation affects the fetal outcome. As already said, the regional anesthesia is often preferred because of less fetal drug exposure. In special situations may take uh, more time, uh, which include the trauma, in vitro fertilization, neuro procedure, cardiac procedure, fetal surgery like exit surgery, and lab procedure. All these have to be uh, properly, uh, all factors, maternal and fetal factors have to be taken care of uh, before going for the uh, guidelines. If uh, one uh, thing I'd like to mention in the guideline there about the maternal laparoscopy, use an open technique to enter the abdomen. Monitor maternal in tidal PCO2 have to maintain the range of 30 to 35 mm Hg with or without arterial blood gas to avoid fetal hypercarbia and acidosis. Maintain low pneumoperitoneum pressure that is 8 to 12 mm Hg or use gasless technique if possible. Limit the extent of trendinal bulb or reverse trendinal bulb position and initiate any position slowly. It has not to be a rapid movement. Monitor fetal heart rate and uterine tone when feasible pre-operatively as well as post-operatively and if possible intraoperatively. So post-operative management includes the monitor fetal heart rate and uterine activity to assess the fetal well-being and assure uh, and detect the preterm level and assure the patient also. Oxygenation in the left lateral tube, vital monitoring, regional analgesia preferred. A regional analgesia can be given in the form of epidural analgesia, tap block, avoid NSAID about 32 weeks. Prophylaxis against thromboembolic events before shifting patient to wards confirmed post anesthesia discharge scoring system or modified ALRIT scoring. So my take home message is uh, belongs to the ACOG committee guidelines that no current, no currently used anesthetic agents have any teratogenic effects when used in standard doses. Fetal heart rate monitoring may assist in maternal positioning and may influence our decision to deliver the fetus. A pregnant woman should never be denied indicated emergency surgery regardless of the trimester. Elective surgery should not be performed during pregnancy. Avoid surgery during organ in the first trimester if possible and second trimester the most optimal for surgery. 
Thank you. Thanks everyone for patiently. Uh, thank you, Amit. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, many of the things are already known, Amit. Probably we would be more, we would like to know more from you. What are the new advances? New advances in terms of fetal monitoring during the intraoperative period. Newer guidelines in terms of thromboprophylaxis. Newer effect of new, newer drugs on post of good postoperative pain management with minimal risk to the fetus. Really, these are some of the areas which we on which you can. But do we have time, or should we take the questions at the end? Jay Prakash. Ah, uh, you can uh, ask that, sir. Because two minutes already we have given for the discussion, but it, it took little more time. It's okay. Okay, okay, so okay. okay uh, we'll take, we'll in last we can we, we in last we can ask the question. Okay, fine, fine. In two minutes, if you can answer, I mean, it will be good. I have asked probably too many questions. You just ask. Uh, can you tell me what has been the new advances in the intraoperative fetal monitoring for patients undergoing non-obstructive surgery during pregnancy? Sir, uh, during uh, if uh, we want to go for uh, external uterine, uh, if there is a surgery which involves the uterine manipulations, we have can have a topo dynamometer for external uterine tone uh, observation during the intraoperative period. Preoperatively, we can go for the fetal heart rate uh, monitoring by the that we are using the fetal heart rate uh, ultrasound in the ops or gynae, and postoperatively also. And also, we have to confirm by the ultrasonography, preoperative and postoperative, about the viability of the fetus and the fetal heart rate, early deceleration and this. Uh, yeah, that, that part we know. I, I'm asking you specific about the intraoperative fetal monitoring. If there has been any uh, any uh, standard of care, is there any new standard of care? That's what we were asking you. Yes, sir, uh, uh, I had not uh, studied about that in detail. Okay, okay. I have and you, ma'am, do you want to say anything? Is usually used during the yeah. I, I will. I will request Doctor um, Anju, ma'am. Anju Grewal, ma'am, is there? Yes, ma'am. If you would yeah, you like uh, to throw some light? Yeah, just a few things that I would. I'll come to your question, but a few things that you talked about. Uh, an excellent talk. First of all, I should say, Doctor Amit, you really made the, the things very simple and presented it very well. Uh, as far as fasting guidelines are concerned, I believe that you should not keep your mothers fasting overnight, rather have an eight hour fasting for solids and allow them clear liquids as good as two to three hours prior to surgery. It's very important because uh, there is an incidence of ketoacidosis found if they are fasted for a very long time. Right. And one is that too, uh, as far as uh, the fetal monitor, intraoperative fetal monitoring is concerned, the latest ACOG guidelines actually do not recommend a continuous fetal intraoperative fetal monitoring. They recommend that the uh, monitoring be done just immediately before and, of course, uh, postoperatively. If the surgery permits intraoperative monitoring, uh, we can perhaps do it in specific cases where you are expecting some kind of utroplacentous uh, compromise coming in. So, but the main key factors here to remember is that no kind of utroplacental compromise in the form of either hypotension, hypoxia that you all talked about should be, you know, uh, allowed. So you need to keep your patient in normal physiological milieu. Uh, now, one more point I would like to like to focus is there is an increased incidence of awareness of for these mothers because we tend to lower down our MAC values. So, however, having said that. We need to understand that if there is no imminent delivery, we need to give a balanced anesthesia and we can perhaps uh, use a MAC of uh, one uh, for these mothers and if possible, use uh, intraoperative uh, awareness monitoring. The best monitoring is what is recommended. I think these are the few things that I would like to add on. Uh, excellent talk, Dr. Abit. Thank you, Dr. Abit. I think, Madam, you can introduce the next speaker. Yeah. Hello. Thank Excuse you. me. Uh, can we will I take ask questions question? at the end. We will take questions okay. at the end. Okay. So it's a it's a privilege to invite Dr. Avinash Kumar, who's a medical officer in the government of Jharkhand and is a private practitioner at Bukaro to talk about perioperative management of patients with preeclampsia. I would rather like to call uh, a newer terminology for PIH, and that's pre uh, rather than call it. Pregnancy induced hypertension, let's call it preeclampsia. Over to you, Dr. Avinash. Is Dr. Avinash around? Yeah. Dr. Avinash is there. 
Dr. Ravinash, you may please share your screen. Dr. Avinash. I think if he is not there, we can you can introduce the next speaker. Yeah. Dr. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Nidhi. Yeah, yeah. Jay, you uh, call Dr. Avinash one at least. Call him one. Dr. Avinash, usko call Carlo JP. Yeah, yeah, call him. No, we are running out of time. I think if Dr. Nidhi is ready, she takes it here and the next talk will be delivered by Dr. Avinash. Yeah. So we'll like, shall we go, go ahead with Dr. Nidhi? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. So Dr. Nidhi Arun is an associate professor in the Department of Anesthesiology at IGIMS Patna. And she will be talking to us on effects of general anesthesia during pregnancy on neurocognitive development of the fetus. A very important topic. I think we're all looking forward to hearing from you. Over to you, Dr. Nidhi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Uh, good evening, everyone. And I'm going to talk about the effects of general anesthesia during pregnancy on neurocognitive development of fetus. Uh, the previous speaker has very well uh, told us the anesthetic considerations of a uh, pregnant patient when they are going for non-obstetric surgery. But whenever a pregnant mother is getting exposed to anesthesia, then there is a fetus who is lying there in the standby mode. We have to consider it also. And we have to look if there is any developmental issues in that, fe uh, in that fetus. So with continuous development of medical technology, the number of operations uh, performed in pregnant female are increasing. The most common, as we know, is the cesarean section for delivery of the baby. Whereas there may be trauma surgery or there may be other acute surgical interventions Fetal surgeries like exit or image guided fetal intervention. And in all these surgeries, GA with inhalational anesthetic remains the more, co more common approach. So, first of all, we have to see that as we know back in the first trimester, the concern for possible teratogenicity is the highest. And mid trimester is regarded as a safe period of surgery. But here, I want to uh, draw your Please mute everyone. That this second mid trimester or late trimester is also a fragile period for the development of central nervous system and is particularly sensitive to the impact of the environment. Uh, on December 2016, US Food and Drug Administration, that is FDA, has issued a warning regarding impaired brain development in fetus when the patient when the patient profile that is in late pregnancy and in children who are less than three years they are exposed to general anesthesia or sedative drug repeatedly or when in higher frequency or for uh, for longer duration that is more than three hours then there is high chances of impaired brain development and the most common agents implicated for this are GABA receptor agonist and NMDA antagonist and we all know that the most common anesthetic agents GABA receptor agonist we used are inhalational anesthetic like ISO, SIBO and DES benzodiazepines, propofol, and ketamine as an NMDA receptor antagonist. Why this happened? To know this, we have to understand the neurodevelopmental events which take place during the third trimester. We should know that the formation of human nervous system is a continuous, accurate, and orderly process which is pre-programmed and genetically controlled. And it can be readily modified by environmental and pharmacological influence. So there are some milestones which I like to discuss. In the late second trimester, neural proliferation and differentiations are complete. Whereas in third trimester, synapse formation, the synaptogenesis occurred at a very high rate. And the rate is as high as 4% every week. And the significance of this line is this, that there is five-fold increase in the cerebral cortical volume during the third trimester. And this growth, this high rate of synaptogenesis continues into the first two to three years of the life. That's why this period, mid to late trimester of the pregnancy and the, uh, and the early childhood up to three years is a high-risk group. And the main drivers for these processes are glutamate and GABA. 
any abnormal or unphysiological stimulation or inhibition of these neurotransmitting neurotransmit system during this period can have a long standing functional consequences so in in a very simple way we can see that if fetus get exposed to anesthetic agents especially gaba agonist and nmda antagonist then it disrupts synaptogenesis which induces circuit malformation in the fetus and ultimately which leads to neurodevelopmental delay now there are certain studies like wang et al in 2018 they have also concluded that the long term learning and behavioral ab abnormalities of the offspring uh, occurs uh, if ga during the second trimester where due to the influence of apoptosis and decreased proliferation of nervous system, nervous stem cells other possible mechanism uh, apart from increased apoptosis and decreased proliferations are neuroinflammation caspes activation and synaptic losses uh, as we all know we all know that randomized clinical trials and meta analysis are the gold standard but due to ethical and technical restrictions the effect of anesthetic on fetus can at present only be studied with relevant animal models so whatever uh, evidence we have with us is only on the pre clinical animal models and they all say that most anesthetic agents have been shown to cause neurotoxicity in the developing rodent and non human primate brain animal data for third trimester exposure are conflicting although evidence supports that prolonged administration of anesthetic agents is detrimental to the fetal brain uh now as uh, fda has warned against three things as the duration of exposure frequency of exposure as well as the concentration of anesthetic agents we used so first of all we will see the study supporting the effect of duration of anesthesia exposure puni etel in 2013 has conducted a clinical trial on rodents and they said that 6 hours of exposure reduces the self renewal capacity and in, uh, and decreases proliferation and increased apoptosis similarly song et al in 2017 they have also the same result after 6 hours of maternal sevoflurin exposure there is reduction in cell proliferation which ultimately leads to learning deficits again when multiple exposure to anesthesia is another possible risk factor so who et al in 2018 has conducted a study and they have said that single sevoflurin exposure did not affect the learning memory abilities of the offspring rats but when repeated sevoflurin exposure was given to the rodents then there was maldevelopment of the brain similarly who it all has also the same result jang et al in 2020 they have the also similar uh, similar results that multiple exposure of sevoflurin cause premature neural stem cells differentiation now coming to the effect of concentration of anesthetic and this is more important as the frequency and the duration of anesthesia is out of our control but the concentration of anesthetic agent we use we use while giving anesthesia to a pregnant patient who is given for any non obstetric surgery is in our control so the kong et al 2012 they have conducted a clinical trial and they have said that exposure to high concentration of isoflurane that is 3% during pregnancy resulted in spatial memory and listening disorder and more neurodegenerative disorders in offspring rats compared to the control group who received lesser concentration of isoflurane that is 1.3% now i sevoflurane with increasing use of sevoflurane now the researchers thought to see whether the same effect of concentration is reflected with sevoflurane or not then wong et al in 2018 has conducted a clinical trial and found that sevoflurane exposure during the mid trimester also cause also impairs postnatal learning and memory memory function in a dose dependent manner means both iso and sevo impairs uh, neurodevelopment in fetus in a dose dependent manner coming to the human studies there are very few human studies as i have said due to the ethical reasons human studies are very few and the evidence is conflicting and weak to draw meaningful conclusion uh, 
In 2019, they were ill. They have concluded that women undergoing surgery and anesthesia during pregnancy has earlier and preterm uh, delivery more frequently. But this study was a retrospective study, and it's ability to correct the variables like obstetric diseases, fetal malformation or other confounding factors uh, was limited. So, this, so the result was prone to bias. Again, Jenkin et al. in 2003, they have also said that DA in pregnant patient was associated with higher number of low birth weight. In 2017, Balkinskate has evaluated Gravidas since 2070, since 2070, and found that pregnant women experience, who experienced non-obstetric interventions were more likely to have poor prognosis in terms of developmental abnormalities and premature death. Thus, though no accurate result have been reported on the neurodevelopment, on the poor neurodevelopment yet in human studies. But recently, a systemic review and meta-analysis was published in 2021 uh, of the evidence underlying the warning that exposure of general anesthetic in pregnant women uh, may impair fetal brain development. This was published in British Journal of Anesthesia. And in this systemic review, they have included 65 preclinical studies, while no clinical studies were identified. And they concluded that anesthesia during pregnancy impaired learning and memory in neuronal and neuronal injury in all experimental models, irrespective of the anesthetic drugs and timing of the pregnancy. However, the monitoring and the strict control of physiological hemostasis was below standard in many studies, as all these studies are conducted on animals, not in the OT. So hemodynamic and monitoring parameters were not as good as we have in our OT. And the duration and frequency of exposure and anesthetic doses were often higher than we clinically use. That's why the result limits its translation to humans. So FDA has given the warning, but unfortunately, FDA has not given any guideline regarding the dose or uh, type of the drugs which should be used. But there is a co consensus and clinical advice that whenever a pregnant patient comes for non-obstetric surgery, then first of all, we have to consider the type of anesthesia and their potential risk. So as we know, as previous speaker has talked that regional neuraxial or local anesthesia is beneficial and they are preferable because they have effective in highly effective in reducing pain, as well as they have very little impact on the fetal heart rate variability. As well as regarding drug selection, we have to use the drugs who don't influence GABA as well as NMDA receptors. Like for sedation, we can use opioids, fentanyl, remifentanyl, or alpha-2 agonists like dexmedodumidine whenever possible. And even if the patient is going for general anesthesia, then we have to minimize the duration of exposure to anesthesia. And this can be done by commencing surgery promptly and limiting the interval between induction of anesthesia and the surgery start time. And in some cases where for uh, uterine relaxation, higher doses of inhalational agents are used, then in that cases, we can think of using ifotocolytics uh, intraoperatively to provide intrauterine relaxation. This may in decrease the required dose of inhalation used by us. And we also need to explore techniques uh, techniques to develop fetal intervention methods that are less traumatic, as well as we have to go for strict intraoperative monitoring like Doppler ultrasound and uterine contraction monitoring. Further studies are needed to determine the best anesthesia uh, methods to ensure maternal and fetal cardiovascular stability, optimal uterine perfusion, sufficient uterine relaxation, sufficient anesthesia depth, as well as minimal fetal myocardial inhibition. One more thing that is we have to pay attention is to keep the umbilical connection. We have to always pay attention on keeping the umbilical connection between the fetus and the mother to ensure oxygen and nutrient supply. Because if there is any interruption or deficiency in oxygen and nutrition, it itself may lead to neurological and behavioral dysfunction in the fetus. And last but not the least, there should be a proper communication and teamwork between anesthesiologists, obstetic, obstetricians, and pediatricians. To summarize, uh, I have summarized 
the recommended modification and uh, reco uh, and uh, recommendations if for the different types of uh, surgeries in the pregnant patient. If patient is going in a pregnant patient is going for any obstetric surgery and we are giving her neuraxial anesthesia, then we don't need to worry. We don't have to modify or modify our technique. But if a patient is going for non-obstetric surgery, which is non-emergent, and if we are going for neuraxial anesthesia, then again, there is no need of modification. But if patient is going for GA with inhalational lesion, then we have to limit the duration of exposure. It should not be more than three hours. And if the expected duration is more than three hours, uh, then we have to consider differing till postpartum as this type of surgery is not emergent surgeries. But if a non-obstetric surgery, which is an emergency surgery where we can't defer the surgery and, and we are administering GA with inhalational agent, then we have to reduce the duration of exposure by limiting the times between induction and start of surgery, as well as between end of surgery and reversal of the patient or uh, in. Now again, coming to the fetal procedure, as, as I have said with, with introduction, lots of fetal procedures are being done. If it is done un under local anesthesia or neuraxial anesthesia, nothing to be modified. But if it is done, it, it is fetal intervention is done under sedation and we are planning to sedate, use IV propofol, then in such conditions, we have to limit again the duration to less than three hours. And if the duration is expected to be exceeded more than three hours, then we have to discuss the risk and benefit of abnormal uh, brain development of the fetus to the parent, with the parent. And if we are planning to use sedative as IV midazolam, then in spite of midazolam, we should try to use other drugs. We don't act on GABA like uh, opioids like fentanyl or very shorter acting fentanyl like remifentanyl or dexmedotomidine. Again, if we are giving GA with inhalational agents and duration, we have to check the duration less than three hours. But where there are certain conditions where we need to give GA with higher concentration of inhalation agent for uterine relaxation to prevent any premature contractions or something, then in such condition, we have to consider supplementing IV tocolytics like magnesium sulfate or, nit or nitroglycerin. So these, this is the nut cell. This is, uh, this is in nut cell. These are the changes, modification we should be aware and we should do to prevent any, uh, any side effect of uh, GA on uh, fetus neurodevelopment. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nidhi. Uh, excellent talk, I would say. Um, few, uh, you know, comments I would, uh, or, or questions you can say uh, is, you know, uh, have you defined uh, the duration of exposure you did mention three hours to six hours as something kind of a duration of exposure but what i was wondering is uh, does this duration of exposure also extend to intravenous agents for non-obstetric surgery not for fetal surgeries oh ma'am the thing is whatever i have read from the literature is that if we are expecting the duration is going to be uh, exceeding if there is a procedure which is longer procedure and we are expecting that duration is exceeding three hours then we should counsel the parent that there is chances of uh, maldevelopment of fetus fetal brain or uh, uh, or uh, by reducing the concentration uh, by reducing the concentration we can we can maybe uh, extend the duration of exposure, but such type of any uh, written or clinical evidence, I haven't found anywhere in the clinical studies. Yeah, because a clinical, I know that is difficult to do clinical studies in this obstetrical population. Having said that, as of today, there is no evidence to say that drugs used in clinical uh, doses yes, yes. that we use for anesthesia have any kind of either teratogenic or you know maldevelopment or developmental delays coming in yeah but of course we look forward to more evidence coming in future on this regard over to you dr yeah Anil. very 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 nicely presented dr nidhi i yes. i was wondering that do you think that this uh, Monitoring has any role because uh, number one is that who is the, is there any pro, is pro method to identify who are at increased risk of of giving birth to child who may develop learning uh, difficulties or such can because these manifestations can often take place much later and as I see this is often a potential source can become a big source of medical legal uh, issue 
if the child doesn't develop all those mentally, the milestones get delayed, it may be blame may come to the anesthesia. Now we have, we know that there are neuron specific NLAs. In other case conditions, it is a very good correlator. We know S100 beta lipoprotein. So there ca can there be some kind of potential markers which may be useful to determine who are at increased risk? Uh, sir, uh, till I haven't, so I have searched lots of clinical studies which can uh, uh, specify these things, but I haven't found any. But uh, there are there is also things sir, like uh, uh, fetus who have MMC, meningomyelocil, they have to undergo repeated surgery. So there is repeated exposure of anesthesia. But the confounding factor is due to the repair of MMC, there is already a high risk of development of any uh, maldevelopment in such fetus. So there are lots of confounding factor who are requiring the fetal surgery. So it's very difficult to say the, what type of fetus are more prone to get... Uh, Absolutely. Uh, I, I fully agree with you. And probably it is right to say that although it is considered that the mid trimester is the safest for pregnancy, for surgery, but still it would be more than correct to say that no period is actually safest if it comes to neurodevelopmental anomalies. Thank you very much. Yes, I think we have a comment from Dr. Bajwa and then we can go to the next speaker if the speaker is ready. Uh, okay. Yes, Dr. Bajwa. May, may I ask you, some you, question? Uh, not just a question, just uh, regarding this. Uh, the, the, both the speakers were very meticulous in the presentation. Regarding this one, but the first of all, the amount of inhalational anesthetics or even for the intravenous anesthetics. How much is the role of that we have to see the placental barrier, the exact dose of, you know, the anesthetic getting delivered to the brain of the child? Secondly, is that all these studies we are doing uh, on a patients who are undergoing surgery either in the second trimester or sometime in third trimester. The follow-up of the kid, the follow-up of the infant, for how long? Because the neurocognitive development you see, keep on seeing till 5 to 10 years. The, you have to do those studies, the longitudinal studies have to be there. So see the exact effect of the exposure of the shorter duration of anesthetic on these brains. Then third part is the animal models. All of the studies have been done on the, you know, majority of the animal models because of the ethical issues and other factors are there. Now, if you compare to the guinea pig or a rat brain, see the life cycle of a rat, see the size of the brain of a rat, amount of the concentration of inhalation anesthetic, which is, you are seeing the percentage of uh, anesthetic going to the brain of rat. That is going to be a huge concentration for a small brain as compared to a much larger brain of a child. So those things have to be taken into account. Those because all the meta-analysis, there are three or four meta-analysis which have gone through for the animal studies also. Yeah. These factors have been, these questions have been raised there also because these were not studied in entirety there. Then meta-analysis meta -analysis will not actually be able to find these things out. That's why these nah, are, these are, are not these mentioned. Are, they were not able to find no, it and, out. And clinical trials you cannot do. The and, large information which comes in such cases comes from retrospective cohort. Retroscopy cohorts means suppose 1st January 2000 to 1st, uh, 31st December 2025. Is whosoever patients are undergoing, say, inguinal hernia surgery, that database is checked. Now, from that cohort, you go trace backwards and see that which, which of the mothers had exposure to anesthesia during the pregnancy. So these I'm are saying. the studies which are which, which observation and studies can only help. Of, Clinical trials cannot help. The amount of the exposure of the and clinical doses of anesthetic to a small brain, to an animal, to a primate of a small life cycle is much, much more harmful many times. How many times we don't know. So in reality, what is the effect on the human brain that is still very difficult to derive from because the human studies are basically observation studies and you the data is also conflicting there. And coming to that one, then the duration of surgery. We are saying about the less than three hours or greater than three hours, which type of surgery we really encounter in a pregnant patient with greater than three hours? Hardly any, very small surgeries. And then depends upon the skills of the surgeons also. When such patients are to be taken up for the surgery, it is the advisable to get the best of the surgeon who have got a good surgical skills so that the total time of skin to skin should be the minimal 
so that the anesthetic exposure as well as the manipulation of the organs inside the peritoneum is also minimal so these things have to be taken into account while i think as a part of the anesthesiologist also when we are inducing these cases these have to be taken care of and we can give our advice to there also because every day we are seeing the surgeon that this surgeon has got this much time in uh, performing a particular laparoscopic uh, cholecystectomy yeah he takes around 1 hour or he take that other surgeon takes 15 minutes so definitely there's a difference between those things so these are some issues which have to be taken into consideration for such patient that's all my uh, take for these these are excellent presentation and very good i uh, think the concepts put forward by dr nidhi also thank you sir thank you yeah madam can introduce the next speaker please okay so um I would like to invite the next speaker is Dr. Abhinash Kumar, who is a medical officer and private practitioner at Bukaro, and he would be talking to us on perioperative management of patients with preeclampsia. Dr. Abhinash, is he there? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hello, a very warm good evening to all of you. Uh, by me. But finally, I'm uh, trying from Mr. Dr. Amit Kumar Sahu's laptop. So please bear with me. So uh, I'm very thankful from uh, Bukaro Society of Anesthesiology for providing me the time slot for speaking a talk on perioperative management in patients with pregnancy-induced hypertension. So hypertension is the most common medical disorder of the pregnancy, which affects approximately six to ten percent of the pregnancies. It's a leading cause of maternal mortality, accounting for approximately sixteen percent of the death in the world. So what's the objective of my talk is that we have to discuss about the classification, diagnosis, pathophysiology, and the management of the pregnancy-induced hypertension. So we all know, know that uh, so pregnancy-induced hypertension is defined. As a new hypertension presenting after 20 weeks of gestation with significant proteinuria, more than 300 milligrams per 24 hours, or more than three plus dipstick test in a random 24 hour urine sample. Now, hypertensive disorders of the pregnancy have been classified into gestational hypertension, preeclampsia, anaclampsia, preeclampsia without severe failure, mild and a severe form, preeclampsia superimposed on chronic hypertension and chronic hypertension. So what is gestational hypertension? I will be a little bit fast in defining the definitions because we all know that and we are encountering this uh, situation of pregnancy day to day. So gestational hypertension present as elevated blood pressure of more than 140 by 90 mm of mercury for the first time during pregnancy after 20 weeks of gestation without proteinuria that resolves by 20, 12 weeks postpartum. Most cases of gestational hypertension develops after 37 weeks of gestation. Chronic hypertension, is defined as the hypertension that exists prior to the pregnancy or developed before 20 weeks of gestation. Blood pressure is more than 140 by 90 mm of mercury and hypertension diagnosed after 20 weeks of gestation that persists after 12 weeks postpartum is defined as chronic. Now, preeclampsia superimposed with chronic hypertension in a woman with chronic hyper is a condition if we are preeclampsia in a woman with chronic hypertension before pregnancy, new onset of proteinuria, sudden increase in proteinuria or hypertension or both and other manifestations of severe preeclampsia appears. Now, what is preeclampsia per se? Preeclampsia is defined as the new onset of hypertension proteinuria after 20 weeks of gestation, as said by me earlier, considering the diagnosis of the preeclampsia in the absence of the proteinuria when any of the following signs or symptoms of the end organ involvement are present, like persistent epigastric or right upper quadrant pain, persistent cerebral symptoms, fetal growth restrictions, thrombocytopenia, and elevated serum liver enzymes. Now we are coming on to in the pathophysiology of the preeclampsia. So I have tried by uh, flow chart in a normal pregnant mother. What happens is a maternal spiral arteries appears normal, which becomes abnormal in a case of the preeclamptic mother due to remodeling. It causes the reduced cytotropoblastic invasion proliferation, which results in placental hypoxia, causing placental ischemia, increased oxidative stress, which causes decreased blood flow and the cascade leading to the abnormal angiogenesis. Now, what are the risk factors of the preeclampsia? So accordingly, we have discussed it under the following topics like demographic factors where the advanced maternal age more than 35 years, black race, Hispanic ethnicity. In genetic factors, we have history, uh, history, 
of preeclampsia and previous pregnancy, family history of preeclampsia, history of placental abruption, fetal growth restriction or fetal death, partner who feathered, father to preeclamptic pregnancy in other women, obstetric conditions like multiple gestation, H mole, medical conditions like patient having obesity, chronic hypertension, diabetes mellitus, chronic renal diseases, patient presenting with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, systemic lupus erythematosus. Behavioral factors, cigarette smoking to our uh, uh, works uh, is causing the risk, risk reduction and partner related factors like nulliparity and limited preconception exposure to pattern. Now, now diagnostic criteria of the preeclampsia is preeclampsia without severe features where the BP is more than equal to 140 by 90 mm of mercury after 20 weeks gestation, proteinuria more than equal to 300 milligram of per 24 hours, protein creatinine ratio more than equal to 30 milli, uh, milligram per millimoles or plus one plus on urine lipstick specimen. When we are uh, quoting the term severe preeclampsia, we mean that BP should be more than equal to 160 by 110 millimeter mercury. So there should be thrombocytopenia where the platelet count should be less than one lakh per mmq. Serum creatinine concentration should be more than 1.1 milligram per deciliter or more than two times the baseline serum creatinine concentration. Patient developing pulmonary edema, new onset of cerebral visual disturbances and having impaired liver function. Now, clinical features, what the patient will present to us, so we can say that the patient is having preeclampsia, CNS manifestation, the patient will be presenting to us with headache, visual disturbances like blurring of the vision, hyperexcitability, seizures can be present or not, it's a different entity, intracranial hemorrhage or cerebral edema, airway, in airway we can have the pharyngolaryngeal edema, subglottic edema due to capillary engorgement of the larynx, nasal and oropharyngeal mucosa. In cardiovascular system, we will have increased cardiac output, increased systemic vascular resistance, hyperdynamic left ventricular function, increased vascular tone and sensitivity to the vasoconstrictors, causing hypertension, vasospasm, and endogen ischemia. Vasospasm is the main culprit. In pulmonary, we will encounter the pulmonary edema. It happens due to the plasma colloid and osmotic pressure and aluminum concentration decreased in these patients. In hepatic, we will have impaired functions like the elevated liver enzymes, we will cause subcapsular bleed, hematoma and rupture. In renal, we have proteinuria, sodium retention, decreased luminal filtration, renal failure, and thrombocytopenia will be there. Now, coming to the management, obstetric management includes fetal and maternal surveillance, treatment of the hypertension, seizure profile access if happens, and decision regarding the timing and the route of delivery. Maternal and fetal surveillance is indicated in the all preeclamptic patients. The goal is that early detection of severe disease in preeclampsia without severe features and in severe preeclampsia to detect worsening of the organ dysfunction. We should evaluate for the signs and symptoms indicating the end organ involvement. Daily fetal movement counts with the non-stress test or the biophysical profile testing at the time of diagnosis should be done. Ultrasonography should be done for assessing the fetal weight and the amniotic fluid volume. Doppler should also be taken into account for measuring the fetal blood flow velocity when we are suspecting an intrauterine growth retardation. Thromboprofile profile access should be given to all those patients who are at having high risk for developing a preeclampsia. We can give them aspirin 75 to 150 milligram from 12 weeks until the birth of the baby. Now, initial uh, laboratory investigations for the woman in whom hypertension after 20 weeks of gestation have been diagnosed. We should be doing a hematocrit and a hemoglobin label in order because hemoconcentration supports the diagnosis of the preeclampsia and is an indicator of the severity. Values are decreased if hemolysis will be present. Platelet count will, so, uh, will give us the result whether there is thrombocytopenia or not will suggest severe preeclampsia. Urine protein creatinine ratio or 24-hour urine protein excretion will show the presence of the protein urea which distinguishes the preeclampsia from gestational hypertension. Serum creatinine level, abnormal or rising creatinine level suggest severe preeclampsia, especially in the presence of oliguria. Serum amino transferase levels, elevated serum amino transferase levels suggest severe preeclampsia with hepatic involvement. Now, treatment of hypertension. Antihypertensive agents should be used to treat the severe hypertension when the systolic blood pressure will be more than 160 by millimeter of mercury or diastolic will be more than 110. Our main goal is to prevent the adverse maternal consequences like hypertensive encephalopathy, cerebrovascular hemorrhages, myocardial infarction, and congestive cardiac failure. Our aim for maintaining the hypertension is to lower the mean arterial pressure by 15 to 25% with a target systolic blood pressure between 120 to 160 mm of mercury and diastolic between 80 to 105 mm of mercury. 
So most commonly used antihypertensive agents are methyl dopa, which is given in a dose of 250 to 750 milligrams TDS, clonidine 75 to 300 micrograms three times daily, labetalol 100 to 400 milligram eight hour eight hourly, nifedipine 20 milligrams slow released, rajocin and hydralazine. Now for patients who are developing seizures, which we most commonly encounter during the eclampsia phase, but in preeclampsia also we can give seizure profile access. For that, we are using magnesium sulfate. It's given a dose of loading dose of 4 grams over 20 to 30 minutes, followed by a maintenance infusion of 1 to 2 grams per hour. Infusion initiated once the season is made to deliver and continue for 24 hours postpartum or 24 hours post last seizures. Expert opinion recommends magnesium sulfate at least 2 hours before surgery, during the surgery, and 12 hours postpartum. Now, time and route of delivery. Delivery once maternal condition is stable. So it's a flow chart where we can have like this observe in the labor and delivery for the first 24 to 48 hours. We will give corticosteroids for the lung maturity of the baby, magnesium sulfate prophylaxis, and antihypertensive medications. Ultrasonography, monitoring of the fetal heart rate, symptoms, and laboratory test. If we are doing all this, then we will see the contraindication for continuing the treatment management. If eclampsia, pulmonary edema, DIC, uncontrolled severe hypertension, non viable fetus, abnormal fetal test results, absorption plus or intrapartum fetal edema is present, the delivery, once the maternal condition is stable, will be taken into account. Are there additional expectant complications like greater than or equal to 33 by 5 weeks of gestation plus minus persistent symptoms, help or partial health syndrome, fetal growth restrictions, severe oligohydraminos, reverse and diastole flow like that? Then we will go for the corticosteroid like beta methasone for fetal maturation. Delivery should be taken after two, giving two doses of corticosteroids and after 48 hours. Now, vaginal delivery should be attempted in preeclampsia patients without severe features or in severe disease beyond 34 weeks. Early administration of catheter for labor analgesia should be done. It's a very useful technique nowadays. Caesarean delivery is indicated when maternal and fetal conditions need immediate delivery. Now, for anesthesia proper, we need to have a prehensile evaluation in which we, are, we will see the airway, uh, complete blood count, uh, renal function test, and the liver function test. We will see the dynamic condition of the status of the patient, coagulation status, fluid balance, organ system involvement, plan the technique accordingly. Now, uh, talking about the anesthesia for delivery, a wide possibility of the airway catastrophe and stress response with the airway manipulation. To optimize the timing of the epidural catheter placement in setting of decline in platelet count, obtain beneficial effects on the uterine placenta calculation, provide high quality analgesia, including the post operative management, reduction of the level of catecholamines and stress related hormone, possible involvement in the intervillous blood flow, and provision for the means of administration of local and emergency cesarean delivery. Special considerations should be assessment of the coagulation status, IV hydration before epidural administration of local anesthetic, treatment of the hypotension. Use of epinephrine containing local anesthetic solution should be avoided. Now, if the platelet count is more than 75,000, then we, we can go with the central neurological blockade. If it's between 50 to 75,000, should weigh the risk and benefit of the central neurological blockade with GA, general anesthesia. If it's less than 50,000, we should avoid the central neurological blockade. Between 75,000 to 1 lakh, early epidural catheterization recommended in anticipation of the worsening thrombocytopenia. 75,000 to 80,000 reasonable for the removal of the catheter. Now, talking about the general anesthesia as indicated when there is a contraindication to the central induct sub blockade, severe ongoing maternal hemorrhage, sustained fetal bradycardia with reassuring maternal airway. Now, what are the specific challenges we will face? Is that potentially it's difficult for securing the airway? There should be hypertensive response to laryngoscopy, effect of magnesium sulfate on the transmission and uterine tone. Now, a suggested technique for administration of the general speech and women severe preeclampsia, place a radial artery cannulation for continuous blood pressure monitoring in women with severe artery hypertension, place an additional large bore IV catheter in, given the increased risk of the postpartum hemorrhage, verify that smaller cylinder tracheal tubes and supraglottic airway device are immediately available. Equipment needed for difficult airway management should be immediately available. Consider the administration of the S2 receptor entire one is a metoclopramide IV between 30 to 60 minutes before induction. Administration of the 0.3 uh, 
molar sodium citrate at 30 ml by mouth less than 30 minutes before induction of anesthesia for providing the prophylaxis for the aspiration of the product of the gut reoxygenate 3 minutes of the tidal volume breathing or 8 vital capacities breath with an FiO2 of 1 or 100% with a tight fitting face mask. Give labetal all 10 mg bolus doses intravenous to titrate the systolic blood pressure to 140 by 90 mm of mercury before the induction of anesthesia. There should be considering, uh, we should consider the alternative antihypertensive agents for the patient who do not have labetalol or those who with a contraindication to labetalol. Alternatives like hydralazine or nicardipine, sodium hydroporphyrin or nitroprosine infusion should be taken into account. Perform rapid sequence induction of crash induction with propofol 2 to 2.8 mg per kg and succinyl choline of 1 to 1.5 mg per kg. We should avoid ketamine induction agent given its simple hemimetic properties. Consider the administration of the bolus dose of labetalol, esmolol, nitroglycerin, sodium hydroprusside, or amifentanil to blunt thymodynamic responses to the laryngoscopy. Maintenance of the anesthesia with volatile halogenated agent with 100% oxygen before delivery. After delivery, decreasing the concentration of the volatile halogenated agent to prevent electron atonement. And consider using nitrous oxide as a polypropofol infusion administering, administering an opioid. Avoid additional muscle relaxant. If uh, absolutely required, administer a low dose of the short acting and the non depolarizing muscle relaxant because of the exaggerated effect of these medications when administered with magnesium. At the end of the surgery, reverse neuromuscular blocker and give levetalol 5 to 10 mg IV bolus titrated to the prevent hypertension in emergence and tracheal extubation. Oxytocic, uh, oxytocic agents should be used like oxytocin or syntocinone, the drug of the choice, 5 to 10 internal uh, IU bolus followed by 12 units. Infusion per hourly. Synthetic prostaglandin, such as carboprost, which is prostaglandin 2 alpha, 0.25 mg in the myometrium or IM every 10 to 15 minutes, still 2 mg may be given. Mesoprostol, oral or rectal intraeltrine can be given, avoid ergometry because it cause hypertension. Fluid management is very important. Total input should be limited to 80 ml per hour. If oxytocin is used, it should not be given a high concentration, 30 international units in 500 ml. As per the NICE guidelines, and the volume of the fluid induced in the total input avoid fluid overload. If oliguria before delivery, no specific intervention needed except to encourage early delivery. Post operatively, an oliguric patient having the urine output less than 30 ml per hour for two hours or less than 500 ml in 24 hours should be given a limited trial of IV fluid bolus, usually starting with 250 to 500 ml. In the setting of oliguria and reduced oxygen saturation that is below 95%, pulmonary edema should be strongly suspected and diuresis is indicated. Now, talking about one specific syndrome associated with preeclampsia, is the HELP syndrome. HELP syndrome refers to the development of the hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and a low platelet count in women with preeclampsia. Sign and symptoms, patient will present with right upper quadrant or epigastric pain, nausea and vomiting, headache, hypertension and proteinuria. Management of the health syndrome, assess and stabilize the mother with antihypertensive, seizures prophylaxis, correction of coagulation abnormalities, assess the fetal condition by assessing the fetal heart rate, Doppler, USG, biophysical profile, more than 34 weeks, deliver the baby, less than 34 weeks, expect management if the mother and the fetal condition are stable, platelet transfusion, if less than 40,000 per mm cube before going for cesarean section. Now, eclampsia proper. Central nervous system involvement result in the new onset of seizures in a woman having preeclampsia. It is a new onset of seizures on an unexplained coma in the pregnancy or postpartum period in whom the sign and symptoms of preeclampsia without preexisting neurological disorder. Now, whatever complications, Pulmonary aspiration can happen leading to pulmonary pneumonia, pulmonary edema, cerebrovascular accident, cardiac arrest, venous thromboembolism, acute renal failure, and death. So, obstetric management in the case of eclampsia, immediate goal is to stop the convulsion, establish a patent airway, prevent major complications. Further goal is use of the antihypertensive agent, induction of the labor, delivery preferably vaginal if possible. Now, resuscitation and seizure control. Airway. Turn the patient to left side, apply jaw thrust, attempt bag and mask ventilation, insert soft nasopharyngeal airway if necessary. Breathing, we continue bag and mask ventilation, apply the pulse oximetry and monitor the saturation. Circulation, secure the intravenous access, check blood pressure, regular intervals, monitor the electrocardiogram. Drugs for controlling the seizures, magnesium sulfate is a drug of choice, given 4 grams intravenous over 20 minutes, 
followed by one to two grams per hour for maintenance therapy. Two grams intravenous can be given over 10 years for recurrent seizures and antihypertensive as per the need. Magnesium sulfate therapy. Magnesium sulfate is a competitive inhibitor of the calcium ions at the motor end plate or the cell membrane, causes decrease of acetylcholine release at the neuromuscular junction, causing the reduced excitability of the muscle fibers. It inhibits the neuromuscular NMDA receptor, non methyl DS party receptor, increasing the threshold of the seizure. Clinically, patient with magnesium contraindication the patient with magnesium allergy, heart block, myasthenia gravis, and renal failure. Side effects, it can cause maternal flushing, perspiration, headache, muscle weakness. In, and in the fetus, it can cause lethargy, hypotonia, and respiratory depression. So there, are, there is a regimen called Pichar's regimen, in which give, we give a 4 gram loading dose plus 10 grams, 5 grams in each butter. Maintenance dose is given 5 grams, 50% solution, IM, given alternate butter each time to prevent the abscess. And then in Juspan therapy, we give 4 gram of IV of 15 minutes followed by infusion of 1 to 2 grams per hour. So while we are providing the magnesium therapy to the patient of eclampsia, we should be able to monitor the magnesium level because at the following uh, concentration, it can cause various manifestations. Normal serum calcium level is 1.7 to 2.4 millivolts per liter. Therapeutic range, we can give magnesium by, uh, through monitoring up to 5 to 9 mQL per liter. If the level of magnesium goes above 12 mQL, it can cause loss of the deep tendon reflex, which, can, which we commonly encounter by seeing the patellar reflex. 15 to 20 mQL, it causes respiratory depression, and above 25, it can cause severe cardiac arrest. When the toxicity of the magnesium is seen, the, the, we should stop the infusion. And we should give the patient IV class calcium gluconate 10 ml equivalent to 1 gram, 10% over 10 minutes. Now, anesthetic management of the patient having eclampsia, we should assess the severity and try to control the seizures and total fluid intake should be limited to 80 ml per hour to minimize the risk of exacerbating cerebral edema. BP control should be more than, if the BP is more than 160 by 105, MAP should be less than 125. Monitoring of the fetal heart rate, urine output and the reflex CBC, RFT, LFT, coagulation profile, 24 hours specimen for protein should be taken. Avoid hyper, hyperventilation, hyperglycemia, and hypoxia. <coughs> Anesthetic technique, so central nerve blockade should be uh, given to those patients who have well-controlled seizures, no coagulopathy, and patients are cooperative. If patients are not cooperative, we should go for general anesthesia. Now, post-operative pain management is also very much important. Opioids, oral, parenteral, neuraxial, or patient control analgesia. Neuraxial opioid currently represents the gold standard technique. We should avoid the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs because it causes platelet, inhibits platelet addition and causes renal artery vessel constriction, gastric and intestinal irritation. Instead, we should be using selective cyclopoxinase two inhibitors can be used. Transverse abdominis plane block, local infiltration, ileum wire, ileum hypostatic block should be given as a regional methods. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Dr. Uh, yeah. uh, indeed, a very comprehensive and a good, uh, good talk uh, would open the how. Uh, house for questions. Yeah, Dr. Avinash, you were a, a private practitioner. I guess. Yes. 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 In, in your practice, please tell me, don't go by the what is written in the books. In, in your practice, if you come across an eclampsia patient and who is on mag magnesium, when would you repeat the, when, when, uh, how frequently would you check the magnesium level? Sir, actually, uh, you are, if you are asking from the point of view of private practitioner, generally we don't visit the patient when the patient is getting shifted to the wards. Exactly. That's why I'm asking. So, do you think, because right now there is a medical legal case, a complaint has been filed with the MNC. Patient had problem and unfortunately I was I've gone through that. So, do, do you think that this magnesium level needs to be at least monitored uh, once? In, because I know practitioners don't have that much of time. But at the same time, at least you can check the, the records that whether it has been monitored or not because 
if the reflexes suddenly started get so the blame is put on to anesthetists number 2 is that these patients preeclampsia pre or pregnancy induced gestation they are also at the risk of preterm delivery now when in in such cases what what additional precautions in or, or uh, other than the ones you have mentioned would you like to take from in your practice sir actually we uh, when means that we get a call from the obstetrician uh, explaining the certain conditions of the patient and if they are saying that it's a preterm i mean iugr baby then first question which which i generally ask that whether you have given the dose of the betamethasone to the patient or not if they are saying that you no know, we don't have the time to give uh, two doses just we are we have given the dose and we are taking the patient then we is make ensure that a pediatrician should be present when the baby is going to get delivered pediatrician is present in, in any ways whenever the baby is delivered last likely that is the that is a common thing but do you prefer a regional approach or would you prefer a general anesthesia no so depending upon the patient suppose the patient of the dimcha is presenting in an unconscious state not responding to verbal command only responding to a deep painful stimulus no no, no patient I, responding my, to verbal commands preeclampsia not eclampsia and then sir i am going to, uh, i generally go with a regional approach i give in, them in, 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 even if even if it is a preterm yes sir oh. yeah so what what are your basic you know indicators to decide between the two because i think we have some students here so we need to also uh, you know make them aware what are your factors on which you decide the type of anesthesia ma'am gen uh, generally speaking uh, what on the basis of what i decide is the general condition of the patient if the general condition of the patient permits that i should take the patient in a regional anesthesia i go for that like when the vitals are stable the patient is not having tachycardia not having tachypnea blood pressure is well maintained then i take the patient and try to maintain the mean arterial pressure in the upper range so that because as the body has been auto regulating itself in the range of 160 or 500 is suppose the patient is having pre operative uh, taking before ot the i think we lost him uh, what is very important for us to all remember is that uh, as you, it is important that of course as he said that the patient is stable and conscious and all that but more importantly is the fact that we need to look at the trend of platelet count means the trend of platelet count is the patient and adult spinal whichever is available to me okay but the but trend of the platelet high. count is something that is very important uh, you know we are kind of missing your uh, Your... in that ma'am i uh, i usually see all the reports on the basis of if the if the platelet is more than 70000 what i do if the platelet count is more than 70000 then only i go with the no, no, not the absolute value we are talking about the trend we are talking about trend we are not talking about absolute value so it is very important to remember why did they abolish the point mild moderate and uh, and severe is the fact that these patients deteriorate very rapidly so you, if you have a platelet count that had come yesterday 12 hours before as say 1 lakh by the time you have uh, come on to give anesthesia after 12 hours it would have been actually something around 50000 so it's very important that you have a at least in the last 6 hours or 3 hours a one a place so trend is more important than a single absolute value that's very important and i think as anesthetists uh, we all know that we uh, when we work with obstetricians they do have ultrasounds available and i think that is where dr anirban can really help us out and and we all need to learn the skills of using doing lung ultrasound and therefore you know these these patients are again very much predisposed to pulmonary edema and yes. and of course they might have concomitant cardiomyopathy so this is where i think a, a quick tool using your ultrasound pro which the obstetricians usually have or having in their setups can be i think know. we we have realized that pregnancy is a hypertension is itself a multi system disease yes hypertension is one of it so it is not that it is only it's hypertension it's a multi system disease hypertension is one this is one manifestation of one manifestation yeah so we can take questions we are already half an hour uh, delayed hello yeah uh, can i ask question to dr nidhi yeah hello nidhi nidhi yes sir sure yeah, please go ahead with uh, your question you, you have explained about the Uh, use of uh, uh, sevoflurane and uh, isoflurane. 
uh, which gives the very loss of memory and neural defect uh, in the children. So which one is preferred from your side, ideal and inhalational agent? And uh, what what is the MAC value of that inhalational agent? Sir, actually, there, there, there has been no guideline by FDA. They have just given the warning. There is no guideline or there is no any clinical study who can uh, say it on the based of evidence of the clinical study that this inhalational agent should be used in certain concern, concentration for certain duration. So we lack such type of data. So this is very difficult to comment which inhalational agent is preferred. It is difficult to deduce it mathematically because mathematical solution cannot be obtained because the sensitivity of the brain varies from individual to individual. The sensitivity of the different structures of the brain vary from individual. The blood brain barrier acts as a congruent in different individuals. So I think it's always, it is a dynamic process. So the three things that she mentioned, the duration, concentration and the dose, those, all these things, the three things has a cumulative effect, which produces now, the... Changes. In spite of that, sir, we uh, are using, generally using a sevo So, sorry, I would just like to add in... Uh, something. something. Hello. Yeah, sorry. Uh, Dr. Sanjeev Hello? from Patna. Hello. Yes, Please sir. go ahead, Dr. Sanjeev. Uh, actually, I, I already put one question for Nidhi. Uh, that uh, what is the uh, what is your opinion about the death pool and is it safe uh, in pregnancy or not? He answered in that these, box also. Sir, yeah. All these inhalational anesthetics act by modulating GABA receptor. Mm -hmm. As mm -hmm. I have said earlier, that any drug which modulates, mm -hmm. which inhibits mm -hmm. or stimulates the GABA receptor mm -hmm. and the mm -hmm. glycemic component of the NMDA receptors, mm -hmm. they can influence the neurodevelopmental delay. They can influence the neurodevelopment of the fetus. Absolutely. So, fluorine is also uh, not safe. It can also cause a fetal fetal uh, brain developmental delay. But I haven't found any study. I have found study regarding isoflurane and sevoflurane regarding death. Perhaps it is quite newer. I haven't found any study even on the animal model to to deduce no, that. Absence of evidence does not mean the evidence. Uh, uh, evidence of absence so we, we we have not recorded because these are all retrospective the data driven so maybe we can come up within five years we will see so but the Bajwa mechanism sir, remains the same bajwa sir raised his hand do you so, want to say something sir yeah yeah let uh, dr nirbanom finishes yeah because... i have finished you please go ahead thank you thank you sir. uh coming to dr <laughs> sahu's this lecture the biggest challenge is not the anesthesiologist, actually. Majority of our sections or deliveries, they're conducted in the peripheries. And our practitioners, you know, may not be having that much of the learning curve for the ultrasound, getting this chest ultrasound or whatever. The, we have done one meta-analysis also on that. The patients presenting to you in the peripheral setup at the time of night, maybe peripheral setup, or even in the just the remote cities or in the other part of the country where you cannot refer the patient immediately to the higher center where the all the institutional support comes to the rescue of the patient and the anesthesiologist. Is a practitioner, is a person who is single-handedly handling the patient there, no choice for him to take a decision right and then there with the minimal resources and drugs available to him in that particular setup, he may or may not be having every life-saving or emergency drugs in his kids. So many challenging scenarios develop for that anesthesiologist and refusing that case has got ethical, as has got professional, so many backfiring things are there. So that's what we are aiming for a practitioner module because these type of scenarios where we discuss about everything this is the trend this is something like that but the practitioners we have to think about them also they are exposed to an atmosphere which is the most challenging atmosphere and i think if you go with the data available at the moment 30 to 40 percent of the sections and deliveries are done in the peripheral setups till today also in spite of having all the you know the higher centers the government giving the incentives to the patient uh, for the free treatment as well as giving money to the pregnant patients also. 
where it's a PIH or a Clemsia, the decision to be taken at that particular moment lies on one single person. Suppose I say Dr. Sahu receives a patient at around 12, 30 a.m. or 1 a.m. in the morning. And the obstetrician is also, her life is also maybe in the peripheral setup in the CSC or in the PSC. Whatever the resources they are, they cannot build up the resources immediately. They have to do the things then and there only. And whatever the thing I think uh, they can do there with their mind, the resources, I think that is the best thing. And we have to aim to strengthen those things with the feedback from all the practitioners, what ISA or what anesthesiology fraternity can do for them what they expect from us, and we can build up and strengthen our peripheral anesthesia services. That's what we are aiming for in the, this year, basically. And on the coming years also, that's my take on these type of things. Rest institution, we are handling everything in the most advanced manner with all the support of the staff and uh, PG students as well as the... Yes, yes, you are very correct that there is greater disparity. That's what you mean to say, that there is a lot of disparity between institutional care and uh, peripheral hospital care in terms of this eclampsia or PIH patients or such complicated obstetric patients and what support system they require is difficult to imagine. Yeah, any any more questions? Uh, one query from moderator side, uh, I want to say, uh, uh, why why not we, we you can use uh, BIS index? Because the awareness is very, a medical legal if you problem. have you can use definitely who is stopping you yes no, any, so, anyone wants to take that question uh, among the speakers bis during but bis no, will this monitor bis will monitor the, the depth country. of anesthesia and if you, you know that the depth of anesthesia and the drug causing neural developmental delay in the fetus these two things are a bit distantly related not so closely related but Still, but we have we we have a huge less amount of drugs in these type of patient. So that's why this I this will I'm, only give you one thing. It will prevent awareness. You will know that the patient is not aware that you can monitor by base monitoring. But in terms of preventing neurodevelopment disorder in the fetus in in the child, uh, I'm not sure how much base monitoring can be helpful. So it is not helpful in that particular situation. I would rather suggest that undertake only essential surgeries, you know, uh, truly emergent, emergency surgeries. Uh, as he said, you know, essential surgeries can perhaps wait if they if the patient is stable and the and the condition is can uh, you know allow us the, to take the patient to postpartum period. But why subject the pregnant mother to unnecessary interventions just for the sake of doing surgeries? Similarly, while we do cesarean sections, we need to now inculcate even in peripheral setters, even private practice to understand what is the category of cesarean section, what is the indication for cesarean section. Because I think Dr. Anirban would uh, agree with me that there are enough now litigations where the courts have ruled out that as anesthetists, uh, we are also, uh, you know, we also need to be participating in shared decision making where we can have a say into whether or not this patient needs to go in for an urgent cesarean section or not. So these are things that we can slowly, you know, get up to and perhaps uh, look at more uh, individualized. Uh, yeah, any more question? We have extended 30 minutes, 40 okay. minutes nearly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay, so we, we would like to bind up. So before that, I would like to request to Bajwa sir. So please deliver the certificates uh, to our moderators. So first, Bajwa uh, sir will deliver the certificate to the Anju Rival, ma'am. I will give you I am giving you. Yeah, yeah. It's a really honor to honor our elder sister like Dr. Anju Garewal, ma'am. She is one of the leading torch bearer of uh, obstetric anesthesia in India. And it's a really honor to be honoring her, ma'am, uh, from my side. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. It's an honor. Thank you. Now I would like to request to Dr. Manoj Kumar, sir, to please deliver the certificate to Anirvan Hom Chaudhary, sir. I would like to uh, call Dr. Anirvan. Kindly take a, a, a certificate from BGSA side. It's a great Thank honor you. for Thank me. You, sir. Thank you, sir. It's my honor. Pleasure is all mine. Thank you, Jayaprakash. And Jayaprakash, I mean, my suggestion that from next time, 
you can keep case based discussions i think that yeah, yeah. is meaning actually we are yes, talking at length on on theoretically yeah. Yeah, next year yes, sir here yeah, yeah. you are correct sir uh, uh, we are decided to next time uh, we will uh, totally on case presentation uh, that is better sir and any uh, changes uh, if any suggestion please sir uh, convey the message to jay prakash or me sir yeah sir is always in contact with me <laughs> <laughs> we'll discuss that and <clears throat> actually we have to it should be time bound now i would like to request to anju grewal ma'am to please deliver the certificate to our first speaker dr amit kumar sahu yeah, it's a privilege to present the certificate uh, to dr amit kumar sahu you had a wonderful talk dr amit kumar congratulations thanks so much now i would like to <coughs> request to anirvan sir to please Uh, deliver the certificate to our second speaker dr uh, avinash kumar well i re request dr avinash kumar to collect the certificate it's my honor and privilege to deliver you your certificate of participation thank you very much for sparing your valuable time and presenting this excellent talk we'll be waiting to hear thank more. you sir thank you very much sir welcome now i would like to request to our president bjs dr motil al sir to deliver the certificate to dr nidhi arun dr motil al sir is there so now so now i would like to request uh, to dr ajay kumar yes sir is there yeah yeah scientific chairman sir bk prasad sir please डॉक्टर मोतीलाल सर प्लीज डिलीवर द सर्टिफिकेट टू आवर स्पीकर डॉक्टर आई 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 एम स्पीकिंग आर यू हियरिंग यस यस आर यू हियरिंग सो इट इज माय हेलो हाँ सर सुन रहे हैं आई हैंड ओवर टू द सर्टिफिकेट टू अविनाश कुमार डॉक्टर निधि अरुण निधि अरुण जयप्रकाश चेंज So I hand over the certificate to Dr. Nidhi, mm -hmm. I associate professor. Thank you, sir. No. Thank you so much. Please accept the certificate from BJS. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now, <coughs> uh, hand over to the Dr. Ajay Kumar, boss. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, everyone. Very, very nice presentation and very nice. nice discussion and uh, before binding uh, this is the protocol uh, i would like to call dr prashant dr prashant please give the vote of thanks thank you sir uh, am i audible yes yes, yes. Dr. hello dr prashant dr prashant is the treasurer of the bjsa so please go ahead thank you sir thank you sir i thank our chief guest dr uh, our honorable national secretary dr subinder singh bajwa sir for giving his precious time and his words for this webinar i thank our guest of honor our honorable treasurer dr manoj sir for giving his valuable time i thank our moderators dr anju ma'am and dr anirva sir for nicely moderating this web webinar i thank all three speakers for this nice presentation i thank bjsa scientific committee for organizing this webinar i thank our bjsa president and bjsa secretary for their support and for this webinar i thank dr sarath kumar sir for his valuable opinion and contribution for this webinar and last i thank all the delegates for hearing this webinar thank you thank you all thank you good night oh. thank you sir thank you thank you so much long live i say thank you long live i say long live i say long live i say long live i say long live